welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. Today we are talking about fat, specifically the type of fat you should be eating for your health and longevity. And to join me today, we've got Dr. James Nickel Antonio, boy, that's a good name, who actually is the co-author with a brand new book called Super Fuel. And he's the co-author with my good friend, Dr. Joseph Mercola. So welcome to the podcast today. Thanks for having me. So he's an, he's an internationally known and respected research scientist. He's actually spent a decade studying the effects of different fats on the body. And I might add, and I hope we'll get to it, the effect of salt on the body. So you talk about a couple of great controversial topics to have on the Gundry podcast. I couldn't have picked a better author. So Superfuel talks about the ketogenic keys to unlock the secrets of good fats, bad fats, and great health. Okay, so come on now, your body doesn't need fat. I mean, Dr. Esselson would tell you you don't need fat. Dr. T. Colin Campbell would tell you you don't need fat. Come on, Doc, what's the deal? Give me the straight. Well, what's interesting is, you know, a lot of people that are doing the ketogenic diet actually think all fats are the same. Like they don't really decipher really good fats from bad fats a lot of time. And so really the reason why I wrote this book was to really dive deep and try to understand, is there a difference between, let's say, the fat in an avocado or the fat in wild seafood and let's say the fats in bacon or butter? And it turns out there is a big difference. And so, you know, really that's what the book is all about, trying to pick the healthiest foods that provide the fats to actually make you a better fat burning machine. So you mean there is a difference? I shouldn't eat a stick of butter every day uh, if I'm on a ketogenic diet. That, that's, that's not good for me? Correct. I mean, and I, I'm honestly an offender of that. Like a few years ago, <laughs> I was probably putting too much heavy cream in my coffee and I started gaining weight. And so that's when I realized I need to really research the different types of fats to see how they metabolize in your own body. So just take, for example, omega-3 fats. They actually increase your fat burning genes in the liver. So if you and I are sitting here and we're consuming three or four grams of omega-3s from, let's say, fish oil, or we're getting it from wild seafood, we are literally, our beta oxidation, our fat burning in the liver is 20% higher. And if we're exercising, our beta oxidation in our liver or our fat burning goes up by 30%, simply by consuming more omega-3s. And so it's almost like if you swap out and replace butter with omega-3s, it's almost like swapping out a V4 engine for a V8 engine. You are literally more efficient and better at burning fat. And so that's just one key that really Superfuel dives into. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up omega-3s. Um, you know, you m mentioned salmon. So there's a lot of confusion, particularly I take care of a lot of vegan and vegetarian patients. And a ton, a ton of them use a lot of flaxseed oil because it is a short chain omega-3. And when I measure their omega-3 index, which looks at DHA and EPA, it's in the it's in the toilet. They have no DHA and EPA. So tell me a little bit about. So what's the difference between a short chain omega three and a long chain omega three and and our health? Right. So what you were referring to, what vegans and vegetarians are mostly consuming, is the plant omega three, which is called alpha linolenic acid. And so our bodies do have an ability to convert that to the longer chain quote unquote marine omega threes, EPA and DHA but it's not very efficient at doing that. So to give you an example, only about you know, five or 10% of the ALA that you're getting is gonna to convert to EPA, and only about 0.5% is gonna to convert to DHA. So unless you're a woman of childbearing age, you're not a good converter of these plant omega-3s to these marine omega-3s. And you know, really DHA is one of the most important fats for the brain. I mean, every third fat in the brain is DHA. And it's important for eye health as well. And so if you're not consuming DHA, at least from an, al like an algae oil, so you can get it from, you know, a quote unquote vegetarian, vegan type of source, 
but it is missed. I'm glad you brought that up. That's an important fat that a lot of people aren't getting in their diet. Yeah, um, and I have my, particularly my vegans, take the algae DHA, and it's just great. But your point, I, I want to really stress, because I, I bring this up repeatedly in The Longevity Paradox, my new book, uh, that our brain is anywhere from 60 to 70 percent fat, and of that fat, DHA is, is about half of, of that fat. And there's some beautiful studies in humans looking at MRIs of brain size and of the hippocampal size, the memory centers. And people who have the highest omega-3 index have the biggest brains and the largest memory centers. And people who have the lowest levels of DHA and EPA have the most shrunken brains and the smallest areas of memory. And that goes back, I'm old enough to remember that my mother said that fish was brain food. And so I would assume that you and Dr. McCullough would say the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you think about it, we actually, through an evolutionary times, and I go through this in Superfuel, I was almost curious myself, DHA is so important, where would we have gotten it in Africa? Like, how did we obtain DHA? And in fact, because um, animals besides hyenas can get at the skull and the brain of um, their their kills. We were we had access to this basically great source of DHA that no other animal besides a hyena could get to. And so there's sites in Africa over two million years ago where our ancient ancestors are literally just surrounded by cracked open skulls. And to give you an example of how high the DHA content is of brain, it's 30 percent more concentrated than salmon. And so we had this source of DHA for millions of years, and, and that's partly why it's so important for brain health and why we have so much of it in our brain, is we had a really good access to it, not just through seafood, but also through literally brain. So you're not telling me to go eat some brains tonight? No, yeah. no, ex I'm not. But it, it goes to the fact that your body has had access to this quote-unquote marine omega-3 for millions of years. And so we've evolved on actually adequate intakes, even when we aren't near a coastline. Gotcha. Okay, so in general, these long chain omega-3 fats, we can get from deep water fish, we can get from krill, uh, and we can get from, you know, molecularly distilled fish oil. Uh, are you, everybody, talks to me and they said, oh my gosh, you know, fish oil, there's tons of heavy metals in fish oil and it, it, that's a dangerous thing. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, there is somewhat of a concern, not really with fish oil per se. A lot of it gets filtered out. I would say though, wild seafood, you do need to make sure you're sourcing it correctly. I mean, there are clean waters in Canada, Alaska, um, New Zealand and other areas, but there are obviously other areas that are much more contaminated. So kind of my philosophy is I, I eat wild seafood twice a week. And on days I'm not consuming wild seafood, the other days, I'm consuming high doses of krill oil to get that healthy astaxanthin, which is a healthy carotenoid, and as well as choline, it's very high in phosphatidylcholine, which is important for the brain. And then also I consume high doses of omega-3 fish oil. Um, so I combine both of them, but you don't really need to worry about really heavy metals in fish oil. I mean, some fish oils, you might need to worry about the oxidation products. So I keep my fish oil in the freezer to prevent it. Won't, a real true fish oil will not freeze in the freezer. And it's that this is what the fish use in their cell membrane. So they don't freeze in cold water. Um, people always get shocked at me like, Dr. D, you put your fish oil in the freezer. Absolutely. It actually significantly reduces it from oxidizing. So I wouldn't really more worry about the contamination of fish oil. I do worry, though, more a little bit more about the oxidation of it. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna leave fish oil, but we gotta we gotta lay one to rest. So this past week, big study once again showed that fish oil is worthless for cardiovascular health, as well as vitamin D is worthless. Uh, what say you? Okay. So that study was the vital study, and they tested only 840 milligrams of EPA and DHA, which is a very low dose, so less than a gram of active omega-3s. And we had a study that came out 
at, on, the, on the same day, the full results came out of the reduce it study where they I've been publishing for a decade that they weren't giving a high dose of omega three, but in reduce it, they finally gave four grams of EPA. And so the reduce it study did show a significant 25% reduction in cardiovascular events. And if you actually look at vital, there was a significant benefit on the primary endpoint in those who consumed less than 1.5 fish meals per week. But people that were eating more than one and a half fish meals per week, they didn't see that benefit. So that makes sense. If you're already consuming fish, adding a little bit of omega-3 fish oil isn't going to do any benefit. But if you aren't consuming a lot of fish per week, then you did. There was a significant about 20% reduction in the primary endpoint and about a 50% reduction in heart attacks and death from heart attacks, which is very important. Yeah, and I think that's really important. The, the devil is in the details. And, you know, those of us who write and review the literature, the abstract tells you one thing, but you got to get the paper and see what it actually says. And sensationalism works really good as headlines. So it's actually far more exciting to say fish oil doesn't work than to say fish oil is, is pretty good for you. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we'll leave omega threes. Let's talk about the other fat, omega six. And everybody kind of hears, uh, you, know, you got to have a balance of omega three and omega six, or omega sixes are bad for you. Uh, give me your take on omega sixes. Yeah, I think if you're getting omega six, or which is linoleic acid, it's the parent omega six which gets eventually converted to arachidonic acid as it gets elongated in the body. If it's coming from whole foods, that's, that's okay. Um, because the whole food, like in a nut or a seed, is going to have a coating protecting that very unstable omega-6 fat from oxidizing in, your, in the acidity of your stomach. Um, and it's going to have vitamin E to protect the linoleic acid or the omega-6 from oxidizing. So nature is very smart. It packages highly um, unstable fats, you know, in, in a seed or a nut or some other type of substance and puts vitamin E there. The problem is, is with these heart healthy vegetable oils, they have been already oxidized because you can't just squeeze a cotton seed or you can't squeeze a soybean and, and you get a lot of oil out of it. it. It requires heavy machinery, hexane solvents, high heat. And so those vegetable oils that you're told to cook with they're already oxidized before you even start cooking them in your, in your pan. And so, and then you start cooking these omega-6 heart healthy vegetable oils, you oxidize them further, you consume them in the gut and your own acid starts oxidizing them. And then you absorb these omega-6 fats. And what's really, I think you'll really appreciate this. There was a study that showed if you give omega-6 to animals, it actually grows the bacteria that produces LPS. Whereas if you gave the animals omega-3, the bacteria that would thrive was bacteria that didn't produce LPS. So it almost goes to show you that this omega-3-6 balance is even controlling your gut microbiome, which when I read that, I, I was actually pretty shocked. Yeah, there's actually some very interesting work. I talk about in the plant paradox that omega-3s, uh, long-chain omega-3s actually prevent LPSs from appearing in the bloodstream, partially because they change the gut microbiome. You're absolutely right. Yep. But what about, what about the evil long chain omega fat or acidonic acid? What, what's your thought about it? Is, it? is it evil or did it get a bad name? It's not evil. I mean, your brain is also very highly saturated in arachidonic acid. Um, the problem is, is that Arachidonic acid is also very susceptible to oxidation. And so it, get, it gets a bad rap, um, I think, because of that. And also because, you know, animal foods have gotten a bad rap, which are high in arachidonic acid. And so as long as you can prevent arachidonic acid from metabolizing and forming its pro-inflammatory metabolites, which omega-3s do, then it's not an issue. But you, there are people with issues that are consuming the linoleic acid, creating oxidation in the body and actually oxidizing the arachidonic acid. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, it's actually the short chain omega-6 fats. They're actually right. the troublemaker that are potentiating arachidonic acid, which you're right, is the other important long chain fat in your brain. 
And there's actually a beautiful study out of the University of Texas giving athletes omega-6 fats as a supplement. And these guys actually had better athletic performance, but shockingly, their inflammation levels went down with the addition of these supplements. And uh, so I think it's gotten a bad rap, quite honestly, as long as it comes in the whole package. Okay? Yep. All right, so now wait a minute, Dr. D. All these healthy vegetable oils, you don't mean canola oil as well. I mean, everybody knows how good that is for your heart. <laughs> well, you know, in fact, canola oil is, you know, healthier than these heart healthy, you know, quote unquote, vegetable oils because it's higher in omega-3. But the problem is I still wouldn't consume it. And I certainly would never cook with that because again, it's still an unstable polyunsaturated fat, meaning there's a bunch of double bonds that can oxidize in these fats, whereas animal fats are fully saturated. They don't have any double bonds that are susceptible to these free radical attacks. And so if you want to cook with, with an oil, canola is probably one of the worst. Um, but what actually a lot of people don't realize is extra virgin olive oil is actually one of the best oils to cook with. And it, because it's so high in polyphenols, it completely prevents the oil from oxidizing, whereas canola has virtually zero polyphenol. And so if you're going to cook with a non-saturated fat like coconut oil or butter, which are stable fats. If you're going to cook with an unsaturated fat, it better have a ton of polyphenols in it, like extra virgin olive oil, or you're in big trouble. Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, there are actually very good published studies that uh, olive oil withstands high heat, does not oxidize with high, with high heat. And it's one of the hardest things I have to do to convince my patients that it's perfectly safe to cook with olive oil. Not only perfectly safe, but it's one of the better cooking oils. It is. I mean, they literally just did a study comparing olive oil to not only coconut oil, which is one of the most highly saturated uh, fats, 90% of it is saturated fat, coconut oil, but also avocado oil as well. And in and, and olive oil one, extra virgin olive oil had the least oxidation products, even compared to coconut oil. So it is, I mean, even though it has a, a low smoke point, a lot right. of people get this confused. They get confused with smoke point and oxidation. And so just because something has a high smoke point like canola oil or grapeseed oil does not mean it's not going to oxidize. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, canola oil and grapeseed oil, people often hear the word grapeseed and they think of grapeseed extract, which is tons of polyphenols. But grapeseed oil is devoid of polyphenols. It's one of the worst. Yes, it is. I mean, it's got an omega-6 to 3 ratio of like 700 to 1. Yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> nasty stuff. Okay, so when, when these oils oxidize, uh, I tell people think of something going rancid or getting rusty. What effect do these oxidized oils have on us? Why, why don't we want that in us? Yeah, well, I think it's important to differentiate oxidation of omega-3 in your body versus omega-6. So actually, your body has to have a signal to tell itself that it's under attack and that it's being damaged. And the signal actually in most of our cells is DHA. So DHA is the alarm system. And so when DHA oxidizes from, you know, in your mitochondria, let's say your mitochondria are being attacked or you're having inflammation in the brain, when DHA oxidizes, it actually turns on the antioxidant response element. And that actually upregulates your own body's endogenous antioxidant systems. And so our bodies actually know what to do with oxidized omega-3. It's actually the alarm system to upregulate our own antioxidant system. Not so with omega-6. When omega-6 oxidizes, it forms what's called hydroperoxides and aldehydes. Basically, you don't really need to know what those are. Those are big words. But what they do is they cross-link proteins. Basically, they make your proteins not work anymore. Just like there's something called advanced glycation products when you cook, let's say, your meat and you form advanced glycation products where sugars bond to proteins. These fats, when they oxidize, particularly from omega-6, they basically form basically aggregates with your own proteins. So proteins in the brain, they can form neurofibrillary tangles. And so 
I honestly think that the oxidized omega-6s that people are consuming are literally, it's literally one of the number one drivers of chronic disease, particularly brain diseases. And that's all only happened in the last 50 years when we started eating heart healthy, right? Right, exactly. Okay. So uh, you, I know, and uh, Dr. McCall are big fans of a, of a cyclic ketogenic diet, and the, the book is, is very good on doing that. Why not always be in ketosis? And maybe backing up a step, what the heck is ketosis, and why do you want to be in that a good part of the time? Yeah. Well, I think we want to almost mimic what we did um, during evolutionary times. And, you know, really, if we were, you know, hunting for an animal and we couldn't catch it, well, we would be able to then just eat the plants around us. And so we were always somewhat consuming both animal and plant. And so we were getting some resistant starch, and so which is important. And so that feeds your gut bacteria. Um, and so I think that if you're constantly in ketosis and you're never providing your healthy gut bugs the food that they need to thrive, and they produce, they produce their own fats that benefit you, these short-chain fatty acids, you know, butyric acid and it has all these beneficial effects on your arteries and it helps grow colon health and the lining of your gut and all this. So if we are more uh, gut genes and more bugs than we are humans, right? We also want to feed those guys too. So just strictly, you know, limiting carbs to a very, very low amount all the time, I don't think is really optimal for health. So you're not a big fan of the carnivore diet? N not in particular. <laughs> so describe to me and everybody who's watching or listening, what's a, so what's a typical day like for you uh, in terms of what you eat or, or even, you know, a, a week plan? I know you mentioned during the two days a week you're eating fish or wild shellfish. So give me a, give me a glimpse and what's the day in the life of Dr. D? Well, I mean... On probably two or three days a week, I'll have a couple pastured eggs for breakfast. Um, you know, I think it's important to get some type of source of choline. So that's a, a good source for me, as well as there's some obviously good healthy carotenoids and vitamins in pastured eggs and iodine and all that other good stuff. Um, but like you said, I wild seafood twice a week and usually wild salmon. On days that I'm not doing that, I make sure to do the omega-3 supplements that we talked about, krill and fish oil. Um, and then, you know, I'll try to eat, if I can, up, you know, maybe 8 to 16 ounces of pastured meat. But it doesn't have to be. I know some people can't afford pastured meat or grass-fed meat. And that's okay as long as you're boosting your omega-3 content through either the wild seafood or the, you know, the supplements. Um, you know, and uh, besides that, uh, you know, some vegetable, some type of resistant starch cooked in cooled potato is usually what I go, go with to feed my healthy gut bacteria. Um, because when you cool, when you cool a potato for eight hours, you literally quadruple the, the, the starch, um, or the resistant starch, excuse me. So it, it literally becomes less glucose and more fiber for your healthy gut bugs. So I try to integrate that, you know, three, three times a week. Um, so those are some of the foods that I pick. So what, what I'm hearing is you're not consuming 10 tablespoons of coconut oil every day and another five tablespoons of MCT oil to, to achieve ketosis. Correct. No, I'm trying to use real whole foods, nuts, seeds too, um, you know, every now and then. Um, it's spinach. I, I love green, healthy greens. Um, that's how I try to get my healthy fats. It's really just through whole food. Okay. So, um, why, you know, Joe McCall and I have talked about this. He, uh, you know, to his credit often goes all the way as deep as he can on a subject. And he tried to stay in ketosis constantly. And it, it clearly had some negative effects on him as, as, you know, as he found out and I would have predicted. So, and it, it certainly goes against what we did uh, evolutionary. We, we clearly were not in ketosis every day. Um, so how do, you, how do you advise people that you see, how do you strike a balance of going in and out of ketosis? 
Yeah, well, I think a lot of people almost confuse ketosis with fat burning and fat loss. And so they're so worried about the number on the ketone, you know, on their ketone levels versus, you know, what, what's really going on with their own health. Um, and so, you know, exercise is one of the best things to induce ketosis. And I think, you know, the cyclical ketogenic diet that we recommend in Superfuel is more so upping carbohydrate and protein intake on days you work out. And really that makes sense because carbs are going to increase insulin, which is going to help you grow more muscle when you're working out. So I think a cyclical type of ketogenic diet where you're integrating more carbs and protein on days you're working out just it, it makes more sense okay so let me let me in the interest of your time and my time kind of switch thoughts on salt uh, and you're the author of the salt fix and I you know as a cardiologist and a heart surgeon I'm constantly bumping up against my colleagues who have taken away all the salt from all my patients and they're on three or four hypertension drugs and the first thing I do is basically hand them back their uh, iodized sea salt shaker and they you know get this look in their eyes of you know terror and Am I doing them a disservice? Uh, how come? Right. Well, I mean, you, may, you bring up a good point. I mean, most people view salt as like almost like a poison rather than an essential mineral. Um, and we've been demon. I mean, the first thing you do, if you go to a doctor's office and they take your blood pressure and it's slightly elevated, the first thing they're going to tell you is to cut your salt intake, right? Like, right. Is, like as, if, as if everybody should be on a low salt diet. But the problem is, is there's nuance to everything, right? And so... When you think about that low sodium levels in the blood are literally the most common electrolyte abnormality in the United States, over 6 million people have low sodium levels in the blood. And then you start looking at things that cause salt loss. So in the book, I really started going through, well, if we didn't get a ton of salt or added salt during evolutionary times, why do we need so much nowadays? And that was kind of like the question I wanted to answer. And caffeine or coffee is one of the greatest salt depleters that you can have. And I mean, everybody's jacked up on a cup of Joe nowadays. And if you think about it, wait um, a minute, say that again. Caffeine makes you lose salt. Yeah. Oh, not man. just water. Not, it doesn't just diurese you, but you lose a ton of sodium and chloride. And so if you consume just four cups of coffee, you're going to lose about a half a teaspoon of salt. Um, and then you think about exercise. Uh, the average person loses another half of a teaspoon of salt per hour of exercise. So the American Heart Association tells you to exercise 60 minutes a day, which is going to cause you to lose a half a teaspoon of salt, but they tell you to eat less than a half a teaspoon of salt. Um, so right away, they're contradicting themselves. Um, and there's many medications, as you said, people are on now, uh, the average adult is on four chronic medications. Most of those are going to be diuretics, diabetic medications, and almost every single one of those are going to cause salt loss. So, if, I mean, there's so many people, as soon as they start bringing back healthy salts into their diet, they just feel way better. Um, they don't get the dizziness from going to, from a seated to a standing position. Their exercise routine is phenomenally better. And so, but they've been scared, again, that salt is bad, and, and it's absolutely not. And a point you bring up, I think is fascinating. You, you say that, salt will actually reduce your carbohydrate cravings. Am I paraphrasing that correctly? Yeah, you nailed it. Yeah. And, and so, so wait a minute. So, so I'll put some salt in my coffee from now on and then I won't have to have my uh, donut? Exactly. There you go. Wow. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So it's really interesting. Some of these myths get perpetrated um, without a whole lot of scientific uh, rigor. And yep. you're right. I mean, for instance, in Palm Springs, if we're playing tennis in the summer, if we're not taking salt tablets, uh, we are going to end up on the ground in the, on the tennis court. And, yeah. you know, and so anybody who wants to eat salt, just move to Palm Springs and you can have all the salt you want. 
There you go. Not, not too much of a problem in Rochester in the winter, though. No. All right. So um, you and Dr. McCullough are certainly controversial in saying you ought to eat all these fats, saturated fats are good for you, avoid these healthy oils. What do you say to your critics? Yeah, I mean, so I've published numerous papers on this topic. And so really the reason why people are so confused is because evidence was buried and is only recently surfaced in the last few years. So the researchers that, let's say for, the, for one example, one study that just resurfaced from the basement 30 years ago, the results were never published. It was called the Minnesota Coronary Survey. And they looked at thousands of patients and they swapped out animal fats for these vegetable soybean oils. And they didn't get the results they wanted. So they buried them in a basement for 30 years. And luckily they resurfaced. And now we know from that study that these heart healthy vegetable oils actually significantly increased heart attacks upon autopsy. Um, and same with another study called the Sydney Diet Heart Study. Um, again, there was some data that was buried in that study and that showed the same results. There was increases in death when people switched from animal fat to these the high omega-6 fats, a significant increase. So we, we have the study showing now that they're not heart healthy. They're actually worse than animal fat. And does it matter what kind of animal fat you're eating? Do you, is it okay to go just get a prime steak? steak that's marbled with fat. Uh, okay, how come? That's an animal fat. Come on. Yeah. So, you know, you're right. So a lot of people are kind of, especially carnivore, let's say, they're going through Wendy's drive through and eating patties and thinking like that's, that's healthy for them, right? The problem is, is those, those patties are probably deep fried in vegetable oils and you're, they're sourced from an animal that's being fed grain. So it's high in omega-6, low in omega-3. And part of the benefit of this grass-fed meat is, again, these animals are eating grass. So they're getting vitamin E and beta carotene. And you can literally look at the fat, and it'll have like a yellowish, orangish hue to it from the beta carotene. So the, the fats from Wendy's burgers versus the fats from a grass-fed beef are much different. And so there is the nuance, again, we don't want to lose that in the narrative, there is a difference between where you're actually sourcing those animal fats. Yeah, that's a great point. I've got a good friend, Jimmy Schmidt, who's uh, won three James Beard Awards, and he actually manufactures, he has a, a bunch of Wagyu beef that's, that's pasture-raised, grass-fed, grass-finished, and the oil he actually gets from those animals is golden color, and it's, he calls it golden oil. And that's all the carotenoids that are in that oil. I mean, it is, it's gold. I mean, really intensely gold. And it's obviously very flavorful. So, uh, yeah. you, you know, if a, if a great chef understands this, uh, who are we to question that, right? Yep. All right. So, um, let, me, let me just go to that point one more time. So, what do you, what do you say to... Dr. Esselstyn, um, when he says, you know, f animal fat is the root of all evil, or any fat is the root of all evil, do you say, you know, he's got some very good results uh, that I respect. Uh, is he just wrong, or is that a, a good difference of opinion? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think he's entirely wrong. Um, if you eat bad fats, they're going to be bad for you, right? Just like if you eat a bad carb, that's going to be bad for you as well. So you can do both bad. You can do a plant-based diet bad, and you can do a carnivore or a high-fat diet bad. Um, and that's really what Superfuel is about, picking and selecting the healthy fats um, from whole foods um, versus, like you said, just chugging butter or chugging down heavy cream and thinking that's healthy for you. Yeah, I think that's a great, great explanation of... Uh what we're all talking about. Yeah, there's, I've seen some really bad vegan diets and I've actually seen some, some excellent vegan diets. Um, uh, same way, I've seen some really good high fat diets and I've seen some, most of them are disastrous high fat diets. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, so I think if we all just kind of set, backed up a little bit and said, you know, and I talk about that in the plant paradox and, uh, 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of good things to recommend that we need to pick from everybody's ideas. All right. Um, so before we go uh, on this podcast, I always answer an audience question. And we may, uh, we may put you in on this one as well. So bear with me for a second. So Gail sends this question in from Twitter. <whistles> Dr. Gundry, I've been on the plant paradox and feel great. Well, thanks, Gail. I appreciate hearing that. Can you tell me how I can lose weight while on your plan? I have not lost weight on the plant paradox, and I would like to while on the plan. Well, Gail, quite frankly, your comment is pretty unusual for people on the Plant Paradox program. They're, the major complaint, if there is one, is they can't keep weight on them. It keeps getting lower and lower. And that's actually one of my biggest questions. When I see people in my office who they're clearly following the program, all their blood markers are good, their inflammation is gone, the one thing that seems to be the common factor in people who aren't losing weight is they're eating a lot of resistant starches or they're eating a lot of fruit. And unfortunately, as, as, as fond as I am of resistant starches for our gut microbiome, there is a limit. For instance, I'll give you an example. One of my patients was having plantain pancakes three times a day, every day and couldn't understand why he wasn't losing weight in addition to the other foods he was eating. And when we reduced his plantain pancakes to things he was gonna eat on the weekend, the weight started falling off. I've had people that eat two or three sweet potatoes every day, and when we back them off to a more reasonable amount. So, Dr. D, what do you think? Is that, can we eat too many resistant starches? I think, um, yes, but I probably bet you that a lot of those people eating the sweet potatoes were overcooking and not cooling them. So there, I do think if you undercook a potato and you cool it, it is very difficult to gain weight on those type of potatoes because those are just gigantic fiber bombs. But I do agree. If you're just eating three sweet potatoes every day and you're not undercooking those and you're not cooling those before you eat them, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. And again, thank you, Gail, for asking. A lot of people that I see, and I've made this mistake myself, you know, I want a sweet potato and I forget and I come home and I throw it in the oven or I throw it in the pressure cooker and then I'm ready to eat. And I don't go to the trouble of throwing it in the refrigerator and I don't I don't think often enough to have a bunch sitting in my refrigerator to reheat. So, and a lot of people, you're right, make the mistake of not cooling, whether it's the basmati rice, whether it's the sweet potato, whether it's the Jerusalem artichokes, not cooling them down and then reheating them or eating them cold. Yeah, great point, so I'm glad you're on. And Gail, thanks for answering that. Okay, so Dr. D, Thanks for being on the podcast. Where can they find you and your book, Superfuel? DrJamesDenick.com. Um, I just launched that website. And so they can go and get Superfuel and the Salt Fix on Amazon. Uh, that's probably the easiest place to get it. Okay. And, it, and this is out now. It just came out a few days ago, right? Yeah, that's right. All right. So I've, I've read this book. I actually made a recommendation for the book. Uh, it's on the back if you care to read it. Uh, it's a great book. It's a, very insightful. So find Superfuel and read it. So, Dr. D, thanks again for coming on the program. And everybody watching and listening, this is Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. We'll see you next week. <laughs>